Uh, welcome to the second lecture of our series, the number of the laws today, on the topic of Professor Rosel Pachirin, uh, Nomos and Tesmos in Sophocles and Antigone. I think we are all familiar with Professor, professor in the lecture today, who studied in Greenland, Salamanca, Salzburg, Oxford, and both his doctoral thesis on the Greek work. He has taught Latin and Greek as well as quality on historical and synchronic linguistics in Salamanca, Salzburg, and Oxford. And now he teaches here to shape um, ancient languages and also philosophy. The master, he's a master student also here in philosophy uh, in the fa now faculty of religious studies and philosophy. He wants to forget the life from learning course that he offered for many in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Sanskrit, and you know, uh, a lot of efforts. Um, usually we start with a short prayer, we invite you for a short prayer this evening on the memorial of Bishop and Martha Saint Yoshapas from Ukraine. Father the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, fill us with the Spirit that gave Saint Yoshapas the courage to lay down his life for his people. By his prayers, may your Holy Spirit make us strong and willing to serve you more deeply and offer our lives for our brothers and sisters. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, and we welcome also Mr. Francisco Rio from the Communication Center of the Diocese, the New Mecca, every lecture of these 10 lectures. And um, I also will with them if the lecture is allowed. For people you know, on YouTube, if the professor allows it. So thank you for coming, for taking time to record these lectures. So, Professor Schelling, the floor is yours, and we are all here and have to listen. Okay, so people who know me know that I have lots of problems. One of them is that I talk too much. Uh, some people also think that I talk too loud. So, there you are. So, I'm, I have written my, my, my uh, what I'm going to say, and I hope that I will be able to deliver it in, in an hour. But if I'm not, well, there you are, I will try. Uh, I went to the internet to see the, how many words takes, uh, uh, um, how many words for an hour, and so if by the end of this I take more than one hour, I'll give you the link. And you can complain to the person who said that 7,000 words more or less were for an hour. Okay, so I will control my time here. I hope that I'll be able to. Okay, and uh, I'll see what I can do. So bear with me. Okay, there are many aspects, of course, this is going to be written in the end and published, I think. And so there are many aspects here that I have to rush through them or even miss them because uh, especially technical aspects in relation to tragedy and all of that. Okay, so there you are. So let's start then. In nomine domini, amen. When looking at such matters as natural law, as the basis of a moral law, a question rises as to why should one look at the classics and most especially at tragedy. Isn't tragedy just literature after all? Should we look for morality in art, especially in literature? Isn't the work of literature to invent new realities and parallel worlds, where morality may play little or no uh, a role at all? Didn't even Plato wish to ban literature, which he called poetry, from his perfect state under the charge of portraying immoral behavior as attractive? What part art plays in the pursuit of or the escaping from morality, it's not a journey in which I shall embark here right now. But I will affirm that for the uh, an, uh, ancient Athenians, tragedy was not what for us literature is today. Instead, tragedy was an instrument of reflection on politics, philosophy and yes, morality too but most of all on theology. And there is a further deeper difference in relation to us today, is that for the Greeks, there was no actual borders dividing any of such realities. For the Greeks, it was ontically impossible for morality, or as they call it, sophrosyune, 
something like virtue, to be separated from the life of the polis and the relation between one and the polis and the relation between one and the community and one with the gods. For the modern man, for us here in this room, to understand this, one would have to dig into the many layers of ancient Greek society and thought, something which time and its guardians here today won't allow us to do. So blame them. We need, however, to paint, even if with very thin lines, a small picture of what tragedy was for the ancient Greeks living in Athens in the days of Sophocles and Pericles, and what part it played in their life and in the life of the Athenian state. Tragedy is a word of our common everyday vocabulary. It's not unusual to hear it on the news or even in popular songs. Tragedy, a 1979 music hit by the Bee Gees. But what did the word tragedy really mean for the Greeks? In particular for the Athenians in the days when it was performed every year in their city. If I'm lucky, oh yes. The actual meaning of the Greek compound word tragodia Latin tragedia, is song of a goat, or song of the goat. And, it's most and it most likely refer to a goat's cry as if it were a song when it was being sacrificed at the beginning of the great Dionysian festivals in Athens, when tragedy or tragodia, oh, sorry, when tragedy or tragodia had already evolved to be what it is in the classical period, its name must still have reminded one of its humble origins as part of an offering sacrifice to the god of fertility for good grape and fruit crops. In fact, in the classical period, in the middle of the theater, there was still an altar where once upon a time, every year, a goat had sung for the last time. The cry of a goat being sacrificed for good wine harvesting must have sounded like a song too, especially if one is under the effect of last year's wine crop. The performance of what came to be known as tragedy was done in the context of great, the, the great Dionysian festival of Athens, which was celebrated in spring and was dedicated to Dionysius Eleutherius. Dionysius, especially in its Roman version of Bacchus, is the god most often related to debauchery and wine drinking. But for the Greeks, he was much more than that. He was a god related to fertility, to harvesting, and also the god of folly or madness, which was seen as a form of spiritual possession. Our words, enthusiasm and enthusiastic, come from the Greek enthusiasmos, meaning with the God inside one, or possessed by the God. Religious festivals were a major part of Greek religion. Their number could go to over 300 a year, according to Nielsen, or around 60, according to Doibner, in the Attic Peninsula alone. In the Attic Peninsula, there, was four, there were four main festivals dedicated to Dionysius, of these, the more important were the great Dionysian festivals, or just Ta Dionusia, as the, the uh, Athenians used to call it. It is interesting to note that the origins of European drama, both tragedy and comedy, derive directly from religious activity. But then, if one looks around properly, is there anything in Europe which did not have a religious origin in one way or another. How exactly did a religious or act, a religious act or a sacrament, if you want to use a technical word, came to become what tragedy became, is a, proce is a process not easy to reconstruct, as one may well imagine. Scholars do not always agree, but they do agree in the most essential elements. It is worth noting that the ancient themselves, the ancient Greeks themselves, had already started to ask some of these questions, and they themselves came up with some answers. 
Among other technical aspects, which again we are not able to look upon properly because of time, Lesky was able to connect the origin of, of what later came to be what we call tragedy with the cult of Dionysius by observing that tragedies are always performed within the enclosed space of a temple or a space attached to a temple. The space is always dedicated to the god Dionysius. The, that they, uh, they are always performed within the context of a religious festival in his honour. And the actors wore the same garments and shoes as the priests of the Dionysian cult. I will not comment on other uh, very important aspects such as the metric structure of the text and the relation with prayers and hymns because that would be too technical. Having established the uh, religious origin of tragedy and its relation to the festival dedicated to Dionysius, one of Gre uh, Greece's most important deities, one must look at what religious function, if any, such representation had. Tragedy dealt with the relation between the gods and the man and the problems which arise from such an unequal relationship. The main problems were Eusebeia, or piety, though piety here has a deep uh, religious meaning and it does not stand for piety as the word is used today in our everyday conversations. The other problem is its opposite, that is hubris or insolence. Hubris consists in not treating the gods with the respect and reverence which they deserve. The negative concept of hubris helps one to understand better the meaning of Eusebeia as piety in the sense of one's religious duty towards the gods. And finally, dike or justice, that which one thinks of oneself to deserve and expects the gods to deliver. These three things are at the core of the fortune or misfortune of every man. And as every year for three consecutive, consecutive days, the citizens of Athens reflected upon these questions while they watched how the mighty fall before their very eyes. Not only did they achieve catharsis or inner purification, as Aristotle, Aristotle says in the Poetic, but through empathia and sympathia, English sympathy or commiseration, they were also able to reflect on the frailty of their own human condition and their vulnerab vulnerability as individuals before the whims and tantrums of the gods. In the end, tragedy, with capital letter, Greek tragedy, aims at explaining the randomness and unpredic unpredictability of life. It aims to explain the tragedy, with low case, of human life. As one has uh, referred before, for Greeks there was no borders between different aspects of their lives. A man is one, so is, is one's life and one's stand in the world and in the polis. The distinction one uses here are merely for one's own convenience. In its aspect of civic intervention, Greek tragedy was unique. One must keep in mind the circumstances of its mise-en-scene. It is integrated in a series of ceremonies which have not only a religious but also a civic character. And all the citizens of the polis are to attend it. There was even a special fund, the Theoreticon, to make sure that even the poor would be able to attend it. Tragedy was not a form of entertainment or distraction, nor was it a form of escaping the preoccupations and troubles of every day. Coming to the theatre to watch a tragedy was a religious and civic duty and the preparation and proper execution of these procedures were one of the most important worries of the Athenian state. Its organisation was considered an act of liturgia, our word liturgy, which in Greek means public duty or public service. Even the courts were closed during this period. Uh, we all, or at least some of us, have at one point or another been faced with that very famous sentence by Aristotle. 
ho anthropos politikon zdon estin, which, uh, with its, if not totally wrong translation, at least in perfect translation, man is a political animal. A better version, though still imperfect sometimes, is found, man is a social animal, meaning an animal which lives within an interrelational community. The translation political animal is not actually wrong, but it is just incomplete. It expresses one single aspect of a constellation of meanings covered by the life of one within the polis. Social is a way of expressing it, perhaps closer to the actual meaning, but still not satisfying. The other dimension of tragedy is indeed its political and social dimensions. As previously mentioned, the concept of politikos is peculiar to the polis, and in the same way that, an, uh, that man is an animal politikos, in the, in the polis, in the context of the polis, so is tragedy something politique within the polis. Since we haven't got time to dig into this matter, I will, for my convenience, talk about civic dimension in tragedy. By this, I refer to the political dimension, that is to say, the relation between the individual within the state, its power, sorry, with the state, its powers and its institutions. The social dimension, that is the relation of individuals amongst themselves in the context of the polis. And finally, a human dimension, that is the relation of one with oneself in the context of the polis. Its community, it's with its institutions. How does one position oneself before these realities? Also, for my convenience and within the context of Athens, I will consider that the word polis, which does not mean city, is to be translated as meaning something like state or commonwealth. Still keeping in mind that for the Greeks there was no distinction between the several spheres of existence which we recognize in modern society, such as a religious sphere separated from a political and public sphere, the individual sphere and the communal sphere. I will now talk about the role which tragedy had as means of civic intervention in the polites, of the polites, sorry, civic intervention of the polites, the citizen, in the life of the polis. It is often said that democracy was born in ancient Greece. This could or would be true if ever we were to be able to agree as to what the word democracy really means. The Soviets used to describe the Soviet Union as a democratic state. And I am sure that Maduro does to, to his Venezuela, as did Fidel Castro before to Cuba. But whatever one may call democracy, there is a consensus that it first started in Athens around the 6th century BC as a consequence of a series of reforms by politicians, the first of them being Solon. Though it could be said that Athenian democracy was a rather rocky ship in tempestuous waters, it managed to survive up to 322 when, the independence, when its independence was swallowed up by the Macedonians. The same date when Aristotle left Athens accused of impiety, the same accusation which led Socrates to his death. The most important names related to uh, uh, Athenian democracy was that of Pericles, who ruled Athens from 461 until his death in 429, at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, which confronted Athens, a model of democracy, to Sparta, the Greek model of tyranny. This is the age of the great speeches of Thucydides, the construction of the Parthenon, the sculpture Phidias, it is the age of Pericles. Democracy was thriving. The part that tragedy plays in the civic life of the polis can be well understood by just listening to one of the three most important texts of Sophocles' Antigone. This is a dialogue in the fourth episode. Episode here does not mean episode as in something else. Episode is a, 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 a part in the structure of the, the tragedy. 
in the fourth episode between Creon, the new king of Thebes, and his son Hemon, the would-be husband of Antigona. After a long monologue in which Creon praises the value of education and obedience, he has a dialogue with Hemon about the fate of Antigone, whom the former had condemned to death. Hemon let his father know that the polis is afraid to say to his face what they say behind his back as to the justice of Creon's sentence on Antigone. And by doing so, he seems to be taking Antigone aside against his own father. This is how the dialogue goes, if I can put it there. There you Hemon is the son and Creon is the king. Creon, should I at my age learn to be reasonable from a young man? Hemon, I plead for justice, father. Nothing more. Judge me by my merits, not by my age. Strange merit, that of defending lawlessness. For criminals, I would make no such defense. Isn't she a lawbreaker? Not according to the united opinion of the people of Thebes. Is it up to the people now to tell me how to act? Now, you are the one speaking like a young man. Who is to rule the state, me or someone else? No state belongs to one man alone. Doesn't the state belong to the one who rules it? You would indeed rule alo well alone, if only over an empty country. This dialogue, a reflection on the nature of ruling a state, on the power of man versus the people, and the dispensation of justice, is the perfect example of how tragedy was a form of civic intervention in the life of the police. Let us remind ourselves that such a dialogue is part of a play portrayed Creon as a one-man despotic ruler. And it was witnessed by the whole of the population of Athens, and that in front of the authorities, which were also present and presiding in these celebrations. Could any text be a better defense of democracy as the Athenians understood it to be? Hardly. Could any text be a better example of the interventive power of tragedy in the civic life of the police? Apart, apart from its religious functions, tragedy was also a form of political or civic education of the common people of the police, a far cry from what we witness today in some parts of the world. Not very far from where we are standing right now, just look at the struggles going on right now in the capital of Thailand, where the king, who spends most of his time abroad, seems to look at his country as his personal property. Does the state belong to the one who rules it? Asks Creon. Allow me to bring to your attention that these lines were written 2,461 years ago. It is within this context that Sophocles' tragedy, Antigona, will try to tell us something. So having reached this point, we need to ask who is Antigona? What and what religious and civic lesson Sophocles prepared for us in the year 441 or 442, we are not sure, back in Greece. And would they mean anything for us today here inside this room? Antigone, or Antigona, I normally call her Antigona in Latin. Antigone, Antigona was the daughter of King Oedipus. And therefore, Sophocles' tragedy Antigona as, uh, is part of the so-called Oedipus cycle. These are a series of myths related to the person of Oedipus and his family. Oedipus has been immortalized in somewhat recent times by Freud and his Oedipus complex. However, many of, uh, many of those who heard about this complex have no idea of who he is. This myth, the myth of Oedipus, has many versions, but they differ mostly in detail. These are the general lines of the myth. Oedipus 
was the son of the king of Thebes, Laius, who told us, I'm seeing the time, I'm starting to become, uh, 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 I'm starting to be in trouble. Uh, Laius, who was told by the oracle of Delphos not to have any children or, or else his own son would kill him and marry his own mother, Queen Jocasta. When Oedipus was born, he was exposed. Exposition consisted of leaving a recently born baby on the top of a hill or a mountain to die at the will of the gods. So you leave the child there and if the, if the child dies, it's not your responsibility, it is up to the gods. Oedipus was found and rescued by a shepherd who brings him to the royal palace of Corinth. And Oedipus ends up being adopted by the childless king of Corinth. Oedipus grows up in the palace, unaware that he was adopted. One day, he too consulted the oracle of Delphos, and becoming aware of the prophecy that he would eventually kill his father and marry his own mother, he decided not to go back to Corinth, but to move to a nearby seat of Thebes, so as to avoid the fulfillment of the oracle. On his way to Thebes, at a crossroads, Oedipus enters into a fight with an unknown man who, uh, over who should pass first. I, don't, I can't drive, I don't know how to drive, but I think in modern terms that would be who has priority. And Oedipus kills the man. As you can see, the Greeks did not have motor cars, but they already had traffic problems <laughs> so serious that you could get killed. There you are. Uh, they had everything. So, uh, Oedipus kills the man. Said man was no other than the king of Thebes in disguise, Oedipus' own true father. In order to enter Thebes, strangers had to answer the Sphinx riddle. Those who couldn't were killed and eaten by the Sphinx. Oedipus answered correctly and was allowed to pass. Later, the queen's brother, Creon, offered the hand of his sister, Queen Jocasta, and the throne of Thebes to whoever killed the Sphinx. Oedipus killed the Sphinx, became king of Thebes, and married the widow, Queen Jocasta, Oedipus' own true mother. This way the prophecy of the oracle of Apollo was fulfilled. Together, Oedipus and Jocasta had four children. Polynices, Ethiocles, Ismena, and our own very and our very own Antigona. As a direct result of such an abomination, uh, a son marrying his own mother and having children with her, a plague fell on the city of Thebes. And while trying to understand why and trying to find a solution for the plague, Oedipus learns that he had been adopted by the king of Corinth and later comes to realize that the man he had killed on the road was the murdered king of Thebes, his own father, and that he had married his own mother. Jocasta, becoming aware of all of this, hanged herself, and Oedipus, upon finding her dead body, blinds himself, and blind, wandering about the countryside, guided by the hand of his daughter Antigona. This is a story of a cursed house, a history which fed many tragedies, and which to this day is powerful enough to provoke profound commiseration and sympathy on those who hear it. After Oedipus left Thebes, his two sons, Polynices and Theocles, took turns in the throne of Thebes, one year each. However, after his first turn on the throne, Eteocles was not willing to let, to let his brother uh, uh, rule when his turn arrived to do so. This is like Game of Thrones, only that is much better because it's old and Greek. Uh, therefore, <laughs> therefore Polynices, Polynices gathers an army to attack Thebes and claim, and in order to claim the throne from his brother. At battle for the throne, both brothers die at the hands of each other. Jocasta's brother, Creon, who had played an active part in uncovering Oedipus' sad fortune, takes the throne for himself 
and bury as a hero his dead nephew, Eteocles, the former occupant of his throne, where he forbids the burial and funeral honours to his other nephew, Polynices, under the charge of treason for having raised an army against Thebes. This is the point where Sophocles' tragedy, Antigone, begins. This tragedy verses around Creon's decision of leaving the body of Antigona, Antigona's brother Polynices unburied, unhonored, and to be devoured by gods and birds of prey, and Antigona's decision of disobey such an order, despite the consequences of which she is perfectly aware. The play begins with a dialogue between Antigona and her sister Ismena, where Antigona informs her sister of her intention of disobeying the edict of Creon and thus honour her dead brother according to what is customary for the Greeks. Ismena, who is unwilling to help, reminds Antigona that there is a death sentence to ho whoever defies the edict. Antigona firm in her intent, says to her sister. It is beautiful for me to die executing such a task. I, beloved to him, shall lie next to him, beloved to me. I will fulfill my sacred duty. Longer is the time which I have to please those who are in the underworld than those who are here. For it is there that I shall abide forever. As for you, dishonor, if you will, that which the gods have set as precious. This man answers, I do not dishonor them, but I am unable to go against the power of the state. The theme is set. The law of the state against the law of the gods. This dialogue not only introduces the the theme, it also serves to describe the two first characters of the play, the two sisters. Antigona, who is unpreoccupied with her own destiny in this world, willing that she is to die if necessary, in order to fulfill her sacred duty of honoring that which the gods have established as sacred. And on the other side of the picture is Ismena, her sister, shy, weak, and afraid to confront the state and the law which she knows is unjust and that affects her directly. Another of the themes of this tragedy is introduced in this first dialogue. It is philia and family. The bounds which tie people together and which are not broken by death. Antigona refers to herself as philae by her brother and he must be lost to her, even though he is dead. Here we see another level of confrontation, the state in opposition to family. The state which interferes with family and their relations of philia, of love. The nobility of Antigona's character and the fidelity of her family uh, uh, and, her, and the fidelity to her family and friends is reinforced in verse 553, in 523, when she says, I was not born to hate, but to love. He, where the verb philane appears again. They were on the bottom. I have no time to explain to you the soon philae. The soon is very important, but they were. Uh, my students should know something, hopefully. Uh, if you don't, just don't say anything. Later, Antigona is brought to the presence of Creon when he finds out, a god uh, tells that, uh, that she is the, the, the one who, what she does, what uh, Antigona does, is she uh, uh, spreads a thin layer of dust over the body of Polynices as to symbolize her, the burial and then she can proceed with the funeral honors as if he was buried. Um, late Antigone is brought to the present of Creon. Here is when another of the three most famous texts of this play is to be found.
Yes. And you looking down to your feet, do you confirm or deny your act? I confirm that I did it. I do not deny it. You, tell me quickly. A, uh, I don't have the whole text because there is also a dialogue with the guard which we don't care. You tell me quickly and in few words. Did you know that it had been forbidden to do that? I knew. How could I not know it? It was public. And yet you dare to break this law? Antigona answers. The thing is that these laws were not proclaimed by Zeus. No justice who dwells amongst the gods in the underworld, the one who established these laws for men to, for men to follow. And I have deemed that you, being a mere mortal, could never override the, written, the unwritten and unchangeable precepts of the gods. For these laws are not from now nor yesterday. They exist since always. These are the precepts of the gods. Mm -hmm. Indeed, no one knows. Mm, okay. Indeed, no one knows when they came to be. Because of your loss, I wouldn't want... I'm going to read this again. Sorry about that. It's the, the thing is that these laws were not proclaimed by Zeus. No, was justice, who dwells amongst the gods in the underworld, the one who established these laws for men to follow them. And I have deemed that you, being a mere mortal, you could never override the unwritten and unchangeable precepts of the gods. For these are not from now nor yesterday. They exist since always. Indeed, no one knows when they came to be. Because of your laws, I wouldn't want to be punished, accused before the gods of being afraid of a man-made decision. I know that I must die. How could I ignore it? Even if you hadn't published your edict. And, I, and if I should die before my time, for me that would be an advantage. For someone who, like me, lives a life full of misery, how could death not be considered a benefit? Such destiny will cause me no pain. But if I had to suffer, seeing my mother's dead son unburied there, that would cause me pain. Not this. And, this, and if this sounds like madness to you, perhaps mad is the one who judges me mad. This dialogue not only confirms Antigona, as an untamed character, a woman of courage, faithful to her family and fearful of the gods and their judgment, it also makes it explicit the problem at hand. The law passed by Creon goes against those of the gods. The implementation of Creon's edict would necessarily lead into disregarding the laws of the gods. These are unwritten, unchangeable, they have existed since always. And as Antigon Antigona spells out to Creon, without any ambiguity or half words, that is not up to a mortal to override that which the gods have established from times immemorial. These laws are eternal, as she says. I have to stop here just a little moment, I cannot resist, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see if I can go back. Can I go back? Oh, yes, I can go back. This word here, huperdramein. Huperdramein is, is from the verb uh, trejo, which means to run. And uh, dramein is the, is the aorist. Dramein is a telic root that means running to reach a place. And huperdramein means two people are running and one passes in front of the other, runs faster. And so it reaches the, the, the place where you are going before. That is the override. This is a very powerful accusation. It means that he is trying to set his laws before those of the gods.
because they would be applied first and not the ones of the gods. Okay, there you are. Uh, Antigona also states clearly the challenge before her. Because of your loss, I wouldn't want to be punished, accused before the gods of being afraid of a man-made decision. Imagine, if you will, the impact of these words in the ears of the Athenian spectators of this tragedy in 441. This is much more than a mere theatre play. This is a declaration of principles. Principles that the polis and its leaders must abide by. This is deeply, deeply civic, deeply political, even in the modern sense of the word. This is no codified message, but a clear warn to the authorities of the polis that their powers have a limit, and that limit is, the establi is established in the laws, unwritten and unchangeable, which the gods have provided man with from the beginning of times. No one knows when they came to be. This also presents Creon as a bad ruler, a, despot tyrant, a despotic tyrant. More, since after hearing this speech of Antigona, he is not moved an inch. In fact, in his answer, he accuses her of hubris. N because not only she disobeyed the law, but also because she is proud of her behavior. Let's see if I can get there. Ah. Be aware that the most obstinate spirits are the first to succumb. Just as the hardest of irons, once read by the heat of a furnace, it's not uncommon to, s uncommon to see it breaking to pieces. A snuffle is sufficient to curb the fiercest of steeds. It is not up to a slave of those near to have high thoughts. She is insolent. She commits an act of insolence when she walks all over the established laws. Not only that, she commits a second act of insolence when she boasts about her act, saying that she is happy to have committed it. The dialogue goes on, and an important piece is the accusation of despotism Antigona addresses to her uncle. Why wait? In your words I find no pleasure, nor will I ever, but neither do you in my intentions, which are by their very nature abhorrent to you. And yet how could I ever achieve greater fame than by giving burial to my own brother? All those present here, these are the choir, these are the, uh, the elders of Thebes. The choir represents the polis, represents the people of the city. All those present here would approve of such an act were they not gagged by fear. It is, after all, it is, after all, within a king's many privileges, that of doing and saying whatever he wants. Again, imagine the effect of such words on the Athenian audience of this play. Um, uh, you have there the word for king, Turanis. Okay, it didn't, it, it hadn't at the time yet the same meaning it has today. It meant ruler, but it already had uh, uh, an autocratic ruler. Okay, something that for uh, the word would uh, cause dread to an Athenian ear. Okay, but not in, for instance, in in the in the kings in the in the south of of, of it, Italy, in Sicily, they were called Tyrannos. So there you are. Ju it just meant king. Antigona is presented as an obstinate, untamed in her resolutions. But so is Creon. Creon is first presented as someone who appears to be a good ruler. A defender of the polis, putting the interests of the polis and its citizens before his own. In fact, he says... It is not possible to know the spirit, the intellect, and the determination of a man before he has, been, he has proven himself in the exercise of power and in the law. 
For me, however, uh, for me, however, being the supreme, supreme leader of a state, if he does not keep a firm hand, mm, for me, I think I might be missing a comma here. I'm oh, sorry. For me, whoever being the supreme leader of a state, if he does not keep a firm hand in the application of his decisions, instead holds his tongue out of fear for its consequences, that man is and will always be a small man. And whoever has greater love for others than to his country, for that man I hold no consideration at all. This sounds uh, uh, a little bit familiar. Uh, I let Zeus see it, uh, let uh, I let Zeus, who sees it all, know, would never hold my tongue were I to see the ruin of our citizens, nor would I have a friend, have as a friend, any man who would be an enemy of our state. But soon, his true colors start to come through when the choir of the elders of uh, Thebes suggests that perhaps it was the gods themselves who gave burial honors to Polynices. Creon lashes against them. He's convinced that he's doing the work of the gods. He is adamant that, that the just and the guilty are not to receive equal honors. Shut up. Your words fill me with anger. How can you conceive that the gods could ever honor the wicked? No. Creon seems to be driven by an overzeal of justice. But in truth, what he does is to attach his position to those of the gods. But Antigona reminds him that perhaps the gods might have a different opinion. The reward that, that an honest man, the reward of an honest man, cannot be the same of that or as that of an evil one. Antigona says, "Who knows how these things are seen in the underworld?" Creon is the image of the autocratic ruler who thinks that he knows what is best for the people, to the point of attributing to the gods his own positions. This would have had a great resonance in the years of 5th century Athenian public. Only some years from the threat of Persia and only a decade away from fighting with Sparta for its freedom. Creon also incarnates the harshness of the law which comes from autocracy. One of the advantages of a democratic system, one could argue, is the existence of courts where the law and its application can be challenged. In the mind of Creon, there is no possibility of challenging his law. His law is as if proclaimed by the gods themselves. His law and the law of the gods stand at equal footing in his mind. But it won't take long for the citizen of the polis, represented by the choir of old Theban men, to see that what lies behind that facade of a concerned ruler is nothing else but a tyrant who believes in his own power. That much is clear from the dialogue between Creon and his son Hemon, which we saw in the beginning, the first dialogue. That dialogue it happens in front of the choir. This conflict is really between virtue and tyranny, between duty and self-indulgence. It is perhaps not a fight between the individual and the state, but between individuals which within the state when an individual thinks that he is the state. This sentence that, uh, that uh, Creon says, um, not, uh, yes, Creon says this sentence. I don't know if you know uh, where he said, doesn't the state belong to the man who, uh, doesn't the state belong to the one who rules it? It reminds one very much of the sentence of Louis XIV, l'état c'est moi, the state, I am it. It's more or less the same. This conf uh, the, the choir who in the play represents the polis, is on the side of Antigona. 
It is just too afraid to speak. The police itself is not at stake here, but the arrogance of some when they take on the reins of power. This is an enforcement of the idea that power is not to belong to one man alone, but that it w but, but that because that will always set the state which is not only the institutions but mainly the people according to the mind frame uh, sorry I, I, I need to repeat this this is an enforcement of the idea that power is not to belong to one man alone because that will always set the state which is not only the institutions but mainly the people according to the mind frame of the Athenians in a route of collision with its own citizens. Let us keep in mind that the constitutional reforms which Solon carried out and which are the first trigger of Athenian democracy had its main aim to avoid despotic autocracy. And despotic autocracy is what is before the eyes of the Athenians watching this play when they see Creon and his attitude. The danger of... Uh, sorry, I need to drink a little bit of water. <coughs> the danger... The danger of t tyranny is such that a tyrant blinded by his own power or by his thirst for, thirst for power, like I have thirst for water, may even defy the gods the obedience to the tyrant may be synonymic to disobedience to the gods. This is what Creon's edict forbidding the burial and funeral honours to be given to his own nephew represents. This would set up the state in the root of collision with the gods which are the foundation of every Greek state. All polis in, yes, polis, if you remember the nominative plural of polis, poleo, some of you do not. Uh, all polis in Greece was, were under the protection of a particular deity. Athens was under the protection of Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, from whom the polis even took its own name. The law of the gods the law of the gods rules and resides within the practices and customs of the people and any one single man who takes power should not rule against that. But the underlying message of the play to the Athenians politai, the citizens, is that if one single man were to take the reins of power, he could and he eventually would do it, even if that is not his original intention, as in, this, in the case of Creon. And the people may find themselves to have to disobey the gods and suffer the consequences of such disobedience. Antigona, presented as a model of virtue or morality, as we would see her nowadays, prefers to die than to know what she knows to be wrong. Antigona is the opposite image of Creon, and it is presented to the Athenians as a model, a civic and religious model to be followed. Cre Creon is unchangeable in his decisions, therefore Antigona must die. And die she will, sentenced to be bricked alive in a cave. Antigona kills herself. She does so just before Creon changes his mind. Not because of reasonable arguments put before him by Antigona, his own son and the elders of the polis, but because Tiresias, the seer, uh, warned him that the altars of Thebes were being polluted by the birds of prey, which were preying on the unburied body of Polynices and then being sacrificed in the city's altars. Afraid of the revenge of the gods 
and the curse which is announced, Creon gives in. But alas, it is too late already. Not only has Antigona killed herself, her would-be husband, Hemon, Creon's own son, killed himself too. Having learned the destiny of his once upon, uh, once upon a time bride-to-be, and his mother, Creon's wife, Eurydice, knowing what had happened to her son, puts an end to her life too. It's hardly, hardly for laughs. Creon is left childless and alone to grieve over his destructive folly. So what are the main themes in this play? According to Hegel, it is the conflict between love of family, philia, and the state, and between natural law, thesmos, and positive law, nomos, and the ideals and principles derived from those. These conflicts are personified by the, pers by personified by the personal conflict between Creon and Antigona. They incarnate these values. Antigonas as unwritten, unchangeable, and everlasting laws. What is uh, sorry? Mm. Antigonas values as unwritten, unchangeable, and everlasting laws are what is commonly referred to in Greek as thesmos, that is custom. This is a difficult word to translate. Some, if you go to the dictionary, some will say natural law, but that is something that comes later. The, 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 the word comes from the root of thetemy, and it means something that is established, that is the custom. That is custom, though this word does not appear at all in the play. They were understood, uh, the thesmoi, the, thes the thesmoi, the customs, were understood as having been established by the gods, and the message in the play is that no human law, or nomos, positive law, could go against it. Or, in Antigone's own words, huperdramein, to override them. As a case could perhaps be made that since the laws of a democracy state come from the politai, the citizens, from the demos, the law would be more in line with the gods. The consensus of the community could not produce something which would go against the wishes of the gods. But this idea is not even suggested in the play. The law of the gods has no known origin. It has always existed. As for Philia, Antigona is ready to lay her life down so that her brother can enter the underworld. Creon condemns to death he, his own niece and, sorry, Creon, on the other hand, as for Philia, sorry, as for Philia, for family love, whereas Antigona is ready to lay down her life so that her brother can enter the underworld, Creon, on the other hand, condemns to death his own niece and condemns Polynices, his nephew, to unrest to all eternity. Not only that, though unwillingly, he is, in the end, he is responsible for the death of his own son and his wife. There are other conflicts in the play, we have no time to go through them. Uh, one of them, very interesting, is the opposition between male and female, between strength and weakness. That's very interesting, but we haven't got time to go through that. Another recurring theme in this tragedy is the gods as guarantors of law and justice. The Greeks have never established a causal relation between the world and the gods, for them both the world and the gods were eternal. According to Hesiod's Theogony, which tries to establish the origins of the gods, they are the actual product of the union of Gaia and Uranus, that is, heaven and earth. Still the gods seem to be in charge. They are presented as givers and keepers of lawfulness, 
by both Creon and Antigona. Both of them give the gods as the sponsors of their positions up until the end. Only when the seer Tiresias brings a message from the gods, Creon realizes that he was wrong and that his position was against the justice of the gods and afraid he gives in. Up until then, he presents himself as an actor, as a guardian of the will of the gods, which according to him cannot reward both the good and the bad equally. What about the part played by the choir, which represents, which represents the human aspect of the polis? The choir is formed by the elders of Thebes, in the beginning, they seem to accept Creon as the savior of the polis, as that is how he portrays himself at first. But they are also described by Antigona as being gagged by fear. After they hear Hammond's arguments, they start to have a change of heart, which is completed once they hear Tiresias and realize that Creon will be the ruin of Thebes, if he does not put a stop to his foolish arrogance. In the end, the choir is in open opposition to Creon, being partly responsible in bringing him to reason. But the importance of the choir in this play is to be found in the lyric parts of the play. From these, the most important is the first estasimon, often called the hymn to man, or the triumph of culture. This lyric part, considered one of the most beautiful Sophoclean compositions, is an encomium to the achievements of mankind. It begins with this verse. Many wonders there may be, but none more wondrous than man. He then goes on to praise the achievements of man, Navigation, agriculture, hunting, fishing, domestication of animals, speech, thought, politics, philosophy, architecture, medicine, and so on. However, at the second stasimon, stasimon is the name of the type of verse, okay, uh, it affirms that it is in the greatness of man that lies his greatest limitation. It is necessary to respect the law of the land and of the gods so as to ascend to the height of civilization. And who and whoever does not will be deprived of polis, that is, of society. The polis is here not the city, not the society, but civilization itself. This is a very difficult text to translate it to, uh, because this is lyric. Okay? You have it there. The cunning and skills of man. This doesn't represent the Greek. This will, for me to translate this, would be, and I would have to explain it to you. And we haven't got the time. The cunning and skills of man, beyond what one ec would expect they would reach, can lead to both good and evil. If he honors the laws and the land and the justice of the God, the state will be high. Hupsi polis, that this is not uh, the translation, the state will be high, is something that I had, I translated in the moment of desperation, because this is, uh, this needs more, this needs more. Hupsi polis is the height of civilization, is the, the height of, of culture, because this is about culture. But as soon as he, on the account of his pride, loses his grip and incurs on error or in error, he becomes a stateless, a polis. That means a man without, without civilization, a man outside society, like an animal. Let the man who commits such crimes never to stand anywhere near my thoughts. The last verse is already touching the controversy of the argument of the play. The individuum who alone can bring the ruin of society, the ruin of the polis, the ruin of civilization even. This Stasimon has been described by Burton and Vilamovitz as the voice of the poet himself, warning the people of Athens against sophistic education. 
Others have seen here a reference to the myth of, the Prota of Protagoras. But the truth is that this Stasimon points early in the text to the conclusion of the drama. Capable of great things, both Antigona and Creon are annihilated in the end. Antigona, Antigona is clearly the winner of the contest, but her prize is death. The self-sacrifice which should never have happened if the law of the gods had been respected and if a single man hadn't called upon himself to be the judge of the will of the gods. As Creon clearly does, when he says that the gods cannot reward the good and the bad in the same way. Who is to know what is in the mind of the gods? Antigona reminds him. From down below, where the gods dwell, things can look quite differently. Once again, the civic religious lessons offered to the Athenian polis, this time by the pen of Sophocles, make use of the myths of the Oedipus cycle. With very few exceptions, like Aeschylus Persai, the themes used in tragedy were those of the Greek myths. The myth was one of the constitutive elements of tragedy. But this is not unique to tragedy. They are also found in epic poetry. But in tragedy, the characters of the myth are brought to life. They walk, they move in front of us. They do so as to convey deeper meanings to the already known myths and their lessons. You know that when the, the Greeks came to treasure, they already, know, they already knew the story, because they already knew the myths. It's a little bit like when we go to see movies, that we already know new versions. It's more or less the same. But here, the question is, uh, so, 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 so. but in tragedy, the characters are, of the myth are brought to life. They walk and mo move in front of us, as they and they do so as to convey deeper meanings to the already known myths and the already known lessons. They convey a new message, another layer of meaning. This is the Logos. According to Snell, this is, it is the, this very Logos which distinguishes the tragic hero from the epic hero. When in the Iliad, Achilles is about to kill Agamemnon, it is Athena who stops him. The motivation of the epic hero is external. The motivation is divine. In tragedy, in turn, the characters, heroes and anti-heroes, deliberate for themselves and are responsible for their own actions. The tragedy in the tragedy is man-made. It is the consequence of one's own actions and choices. In the epics, the gods deliberate and men are like toys in their hands. That would explain why Priamus and Hector, though morally much superior to Menelaus and Agamemnon, will end up perishing along with all the Trojans, despite their moral integrity and great courage. Contrary, Creon is the victim of his own arrogance and stubbornness. Creon, unlike Agamemnon, is a victim of his own hubris. Agamemnon too will pay for his hubris, but that will be in a tragedy. In the epics, he is a hero of the Achaeans. And Antigona's destiny, her self-sacrifice, is of her own choosing. It is actually the final show of her virtue. She is not a victim of the gods like Priamos or Hector. Her sacrifice is intentional. And it is what will bring about the punishment of Creon. Both Creon and Antigona are provided of Logos, which makes them autonomous. The explanation for this could be that in the epics, the divine dimension prevails. And we are actually witnessing the plotting of the gods against each other and how that affects the destiny of man. In tragedy, on the other hand, the facts are seen from a human point of view. The gods provide the explanation only to what would otherwise be inexplicable. 
Greek tragedy is a journey into the mindset of, of the ancient Greeks, of, of the ancient Greek world. And what the Greek tragedy tells us is that justice belongs to the gods, to the divine, and that any evil act will not be unpunished. For the Greeks, all men had the same eschatological end, and therefore payment was to be sorted in this world, not only by grief, but also by dishonor. Despite the randomness of human existence, which is often attributed to the fads and whims of the gods, the justice of the world matters, and the gods appear as the final holders of that justice. However, despite of the logos of tragedy, in the end, the scales are always in favor of the gods. A real balance never seems to be achieved. This is probably because the Greeks are conscient of the difference between God and man. It is also necessary to bear in mind that Greek thought was extremely fatalist in the end, especially in its scatological dimension. Even while on earth, men are nothing but pawns in the hands of the gods who play with them, to say nothing of their destiny after death. Tragic hubris, sorry, tragic hubris is an attempt to explain within the Logos some of the evil men must endure. But, that, but not all of life's random, randomness can be explained by that. The Greeks knew it. So in the end, for the Greeks, despite of Logos, the gods hold all the chips and men must dance according to their tune. Dixie.